Hello, everyone, and welcome to our second PT and Politics of the semester. My name is Ashley Weissmiller, and I'm the PT and Politics Program Director at the Robert J. Dole Institute of Politics. We are joined today by Mr. Marlon Marshall and Ms. Lisa Spees, two campaign experts who will guide us through a conversation about all the good, bad, and potential ugly aspects of a campaign. Uh, before we get started, I want to mention that today's program is made possible by the generosity of Senator Nancy Kassebaum, who asked that our 2016 Dole Leadership Prize be used in support of student programs. We also want to give a special thank you to Topper's Pizza, who is donating free pizza coupons for a drawing at the end of all of our programs. If you are a student and tuning in live today, be sure to type your name into the YouTube live chat function to be entered. If you can't stay the whole time, please refer back to this archived video on our YouTube channel and watch the end when we announce the winner. Good luck. Now let's welcome our guests, Marlon Marshall and Lisa Spees. Marlon Marshall has held a series of key positions in national democratic politics and has worked in states with some of the most contentious election contests in recent history. He currently is the founding partner at 270 Strategies. Marlon served as the director of states and political engagement for the Hillary for America campaign as well as being the Deputy National Field Director for President Barack Obama's re-election campaign. During his time with President Obama, he helped lead its unprecedented targeted voter registration and get out the vote programs and was central to a field program that far outpaced previous efforts in 2008 and beyond. He has worked as an organizer on races at both the state and federal level, including a number of state house races, a US Senate race, and the Missouri and Ohio programs for the 2008 presidential campaign of Senator John Kerry. Marlon hails from St. Louis, Missouri and is a graduate of the University of Kansas where he majored in communication studies. Lisa Spees is the president of the LS Group, a political and nonprofit fundraising and development firm. Lisa has over 15 years of experience raising national high dollar and PAC contributions for campaigns and organizations. Described as the super fundraiser by Capital File Magazine, Lisa directs multi-million dollar national fundraising efforts including major donor events, PAC events, and conferences of all sizes. Lisa's recent clients have included John James for US Senate, the National Republican Senatorial Committee, US Senator John Kennedy, Jeb Bush for President, and House Republican Whip Steve Scalise. She attended the University of Kansas and is a graduate of the University of Wisconsin in Milwaukee. She serves on various National Republican outreach programs and coalitions, and in 2006, she was appointed to the Presidential Rank Award Distinguished Review Board, which recommended to President George W. Bush outstanding members of the Senior Executive Service for the government's top commendation. So thank you both for joining us today. I'm so excited, so excited to hear from you, learn from you and, and hear some awesome stories. So welcome and why don't we briefly get started. Um, you both can tell us a little bit about your upbringing, education and, and how you became interested in politics. Whoever wants to kick it off, go for it. Lisa. <laughs> well, first of all, thank you for having me and what a great introduction. And um, it's really exciting to be on with Marlon. Um, as Marlon might attest uh, in DC, even though uh, we, you know, we, we live in like a five mile radius, I don't know, really know any Democrats. So it's good that we're on the Zoom getting to know each other. Um, <laughs> I'm originally from Wisconsin and um, I went to KU, this is the, 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 this is the honest truth, because my dad wanted basketball tickets and this is when Jacques Vaughn was playing and you couldn't get tickets unless you went to KU. And so literally that's why I went. That being said, that's where I got started in my political career. I was in the student union one day and they had, you know, they had the tables, the booths out for student groups and I wasn't into the Greek life. And um, so I, I had a lot of time on my hands and um, they had a table for the college Republicans and it wasn't a very busy table at all. And I was like, you know what, I should do this. And, and literally that's how I got my start in Republican politics is through the uh, KU College Republicans. And then I continued on. Um, and actually one of my first jobs in DC was working for the College Republican National Committee um, when we used to be under the RNC. Um, so my career kind of just took off from there, but I think you've said a lot of it. Um, I've worked on two um, 
presidential campaigns as opposed to Marlin, I've lost both times. <laughs> um, but they were great experiences and great work. Um, and I do a lot of Senate fundraising as well. Um, but I do focus mainly on higher dollar. Higher dollar could mean anything from a thousand a person to 50,000 a person to super PAC money, which is unlimited. Um, so right now I will tell you, I'm very, very nervous for the next two weeks. Um, one of the candidates I'm working for is John James, um, who surprisingly has an amazing shot at winning the seat in Michigan. Um, it's so surprising because the president could lose Michigan and John James could possibly win Michigan. Um, so it, things are a little crazy right now, but that's kind of a quick background on me. Uh, <clears throat> and hey everyone, Marlon, again, uh, thank you to Ashley for having us here. Um, first and foremost, I'm a Jayhawk through and through. Uh, I went there a long time ago. Um, but just a little bit brief about me. Uh, I'm from St. Louis, Missouri, born and raised there. Um, and so I always give, uh, talk a little smack to my St. Louis friends who I went to Mizzou um, because why would you ever do something like that? Um, and um, my mom was a teacher uh, for 35 years, elementary school. Dad was a custodian, come from a middle-class family, learned a lot about education early on. Uh, was very solid the kind of inequities in education in the system where the school I was able to go to versus the school my mom taught at and had to use resources, resources that should have went to me for more toys. Um, and got into KU, went, loved it, actually started off an engineering major. Um, a gentleman by the name of Kevin Yoder um, was running for student body president and asked me to run for student senate on his ticket as the engineering senator. Um, I did that, loved it, um, switched my major. My mom was like, what are you doing? Um, she thought I was gonna go like work at Microsoft or something like that. She's cool now, she's Mel Obama, so she's all right. Um, and um, just fell in love with politics, um, mostly because I saw that as an avenue to make change for issues like education that I mentioned. And so um, stayed involved in student government at KU, um, ran and won student body vice president, worked at KU to, um, when I was in that role, um, tried to help the administration recruit and retain more uh, students of color uh, to KU. Uh, Cause I believe once you get out into the real world, you're gonna work with all diverse types of people and college should prepare you for that. And so we had a really good robust discussion with then Chancellor Hemingway and his administration um, a long time ago. And so afterwards I was like, I like this, political stuff. How do you make a career out of it? Um, and I stayed in Lawrence for a little bit, bartending at what was uh, Brothers right when it opened. So that again dates me. Um, and uh, Fatso's, which is no longer, I think, called Fatso's. It's called something else, but we won't talk about that either. Um, and just kind of hung around, did some local stuff for a little bit. And a couple of years later in 2004, 2003, 2004, um, went to a training to be an organizer. I did some stuff locally with the Kansas Democratic Party. Uh, and then I went to a training in Detroit to be an organizer. And I met the folks working um, in the Kansas City office for John Kerry when he was running for president in 2004. Um, they called me a week later, soon I had a job and got all hands dirty in terms of what organizing uh, is and fell in love with it um, even after we lost. Um, also met my now wife on that campaign. So like this, I mean, to the police's point, this thing is everyone is it's a close family, um, but she's right. I don't really know many Republicans um, uh, either when I lived in DC. Uh, and so then just use that as a jump off point to figure out how to make a career in it and kept going campaign to campaign, state to state. Um, over the you know upcoming years, I was lucky to get an opportunity to work also uh, in the Obama administration for, um, from 2013 to 2015, uh, working in the White House Office of Public Engagement, um, and then worked on the, so Lisa mentioned her presidential record. I'm two and two, so, I, and I'm gonna stop, by the way. So I'm not, I'm done. Uh, I'll stay at 500, and that's a wrap for me. Um, uh, and, you know, worked on the 2016 race. Uh, we know the outcome there. And then about eight years ago, uh, a 
friends and I started a consulting firm called 270 Strategies, 270 being the number of electoral votes you need to um, be the president. And we help in um, clients, campaigns, causes, companies across the world uh, with engagement and understand how to reach out to people, how to organize people, how to speak about values, uh, progressive values, all those good things. Um, and so I've been, we started it, I left to go work in the White House, I came back, I left to go work in Hillary, now I'm back and I've been back there for a couple of years. And then about a year ago, I actually left DC. My wife and I have uh, three-year-old twin daughters uh, and we wanted to get closer to the family. And so I moved to Denver, Colorado, which is where I reside now and still work remotely like we're all doing. Um, and like um, Lisa, also anxious for uh, the next two weeks. Um, and we'll see what happens. We'll see. I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic. And again, working on 16, you can understand why I feel that way. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you both. Very thorough. I appreciate it. I'm from St. Louis too, Marilyn. So I understand hey. the, the Mizzou smack talk. You gotta, you gotta do it every once in a while, right? Ask we'll um, talk high schools later because you know that's the question later. Yeah. Sounds go. good. Perfect. Yeah. I'm there. Um, so you both kind of mentioned like your first political experiences. Can you expand on those a little bit more and kind of tell us how those experiences shaped your involvement on future political campaigns? Yeah. I'll go since I made Lisa go first the last time. Um, okay. and we, can just, we can just jump back and forth. Okay. So my very, my, what I would call my real first experience, I, you know, I, I volunteered an intern, which everyone should do if you're interested in politics, by the way. Um, my first job was for Kerry. And what I learned from that campaign is it really is all about people. Um, you know, you, I think you are best on the campaign if you realize you are, uh, at least as, as an organizing, I did field, so I'm an organizer. My job is not to tell people what to do. My job is to empower people to change their communities um, and to give them the tools they need to go out and organize on their own community. And, you know, I had a previous boss who always would say like, you want to win, obviously, right? But you really did your job if you leave the community in a better space than when you arrive and they have more tools to be able to continue to organize. And I think one of the proudest, the things I'm most proud of and as an Obama alumni, as, is that so many volunteers who worked for President Obama are now, some are running for Congress, some are mayors of cities, some are, city, you know, like they, they've taken steps to be leaders in their communities. And, and it all started from, you know, having inspiration from him and then using, getting the skill sets from, from the staff. So um, that really helped me in future campaigns just kind of get grounded. And even after we lost in 2004, to still know that like there was all these volunteers I worked with in Kansas City who just were passionate about what they were doing and just wanted, and we were a link to that passion, right? Um, um, so that's what I've tried to take with me as we keep moving forward and, and really um, think about how do we, you know, give people the tools they need to, to change their community. Um, I, by the way, I want to say, I think one of the things that's great about doing this call and having Marlon on and having me on is, it just gives you a glimpse about how many facets there are to a campaign and how many people it takes to run a good campaign. Um, and the fact of the matter is when we had, you know, our field directors or grassroots people, I barely even saw them or talked to them, but we were both working 24 hours a day and it just, there's so much to it. And the good news is for students who are listening to this, who love politics and want to get involved, there's so many different ways to get involved. And, you know, the important thing I think to have a successful career is to find your niche, to see what you're good at and what you are passionate about. My, the way I found out was, you know, I love politics. I was volunteering. And by the way, I want to second and third what Marilyn said about always volunteer. Um, I can't say that enough. And by the way, at my point in my career, I still volunteer. Um, it's the right thing to do. It keeps you involved. Um, but my first internship was working for Governor Tommy Thompson. He was governor of, of Wisconsin. 
And this was right before he got appointed to be Secretary of Health and Human Services under President Bush. Um, so I was working in his Milwaukee office and, um, you know, just helping out with constituent work, um, you know, inter intern stuff, um, translation, I went to get coffee a lot and stuff like that. <laughs> um, but one time he, they had a fundraiser. He had a St. Patrick's Day fundraiser, which is a really big deal in Milwaukee. And they said, do you want to volunteer at the fundraiser? And I went and volunteered and I helped with the registration and collecting money. And it was my first time at a fundraiser. And I thought, this is what I want to do. So I knew I loved politics, but po saying you love politics is like saying you love the law. There's a million things you can do. You can be a lawyer, you can serve, um, you know, you can be a policeman, you can be a judge, whatever. So it's finding your thing. And so to me, I love fundraising. Um, fundraising is not, you know, the, the shtick around town is that only crazy people fundraise um, because you're asking people for money, but you're not giving them anything tangible. Um, so you got to have a kind of unique personality. You know, you know, when you go to a store, you give someone, you know, $20, you get a t-shirt back. Well, when a lot of my donors are giving me a thousand dollars, I'm not giving them anything tangible. I'm, I'm saying, thank you. <laughs> thank you for supporting the cause. So it's an interesting field, but because I volunteered, I learned where I wanted to be. So I just think it's good that we're having different angles of what of, of all the things that go on on a campaign. Absolutely, absolutely. Whole point of the call, we want both both angles, and and that's a great segue into the next question. Like Lisa, you've mentioned, you know, you both have very different roles on a campaign, and so I'd love to kind of hear from both of you what those priorities are. Um, you know, as a field director and and as a fundraiser. You know where where are your priorities and and you know what's that what's that job like? Let me and I'm, I'm gonna unmute myself. Okay. <laughs> By the way, I've I've become like a Zoom queen. Um, it's funny because when COVID first started, I literally I don't even know how to use my iPhone, and now <laughs> I'm like this. I feel like I'm this tech person. So um, my mom who lives in Boca, she's in her 70s. I'm always like, this is how you do it. So I feel really cool that I know how to do things now. Um, so priorities for me are raising money. Um, that, that is my focus. Um, so usually what happens is, and you know what, I'm gonna tell you a current, current story. So John, I'm gonna go back to John James because that's probably the most important race I'm working on right now. Um, I'm not working for the Trump campaign. Um, and as you probably have seen in the news, a lot of donors are focusing on the Senate because we're a little worried about the presidential also the presidential at this point, um, and Marlon probably can attest to this too, it's really not about money. It's about the last two weeks of messaging why voters are gonna come out. Whereas in the Senate races, we do need to still raise money because we need to get on the air. We need, we need to, you know, there's just a lot of money coming in and it, it's television ads, you know, in Michigan and things like that. Um, so what happens is, you know, I go on to a campaign and they'll say, all right, we want you to raise this much money. And usually it's divided by quarters. That's kind of how politics works. And any of you who are involved probably get those emails that say end of quarter, you must give now. Um, and they give me a goal and it's my job to get to that goal. The funny thing about this job is that that goal gets changed all the time. <laughs> So, so, I, um, so um, Marlon and I actually, I think we worked against each other because um, one of my jobs was I was the, um, I was in the, on the finance team for the Romney campaign. So we must have, um, you know, crossed paths at some point, but I was the director of Jewish outreach. So I ran all the Jewish fundraising uh, throughout the country for uh, Governor Romney at the time. And I was also the head of women for Romney. So I raised um, all the money from women and Ann Romney was kind of the head of that. But our goals changed as Obama's goals changed. Um, and one of the great things about that race that I love talking about is that, and that people don't realize how much things have changed. That was the first time. So when Obama ran against Romney, that, su that super PACs, 
were, uh, were involved in a presidential race. So Romney had a super PAC, Obama had a super PAC. And so not only were the campaigns competing with money, the super PACs were competing with. Now you hear about super PACs all the time, but remember back then it was a very, very new thing. And so it was just another uh, thing added to how much we needed to raise. But as far as your question, my priorities, it's money, 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 money. <laughs> and I'm the spender of the money. Um, so I want uh, just to take a small like step back. I think I always try to tell folks, I think campaigns are generally trying to accomplish four things. Um, and I just think it's, it's always good to like level set and ground. This is my belief, at least maybe disagree. You either are registering voters, you are persuading voters, you are mobilizing your base, and you are building capacity that allows you to do those three things, right? So when you fundraise, that's building capacity that you can then put a TDI on the air. That's usually for persuasion, sometimes mobilizing your base. When you are, um, you know, doing field and knocking on doors, sometimes you're trying to get your people to turn out. Sometimes you're trying to have a persuasion conversation. Sometimes you're, you're at the grocery stores trying to register people to vote, right? So it all really rolls back up to those four things. And I just think that's important to anchor for everyone on campaigns because, you know, you got so many different, you got digital, you got finance, you got communications, you got field, you got research, you got all these different departments. And so it just, and when you start getting too deep into the tactics, sometimes you're like, what the heck am I trying to accomplish today, right? And so rolling back to say like, I am doing this today to ultimately persuade people or I'm doing this to ultimately get my base to turn out. All those good things are just a good way to kind of um, structure it, right? Um, and then obviously you gotta build a message and all that stuff, but it's, you know, you're getting your message out to do persuasion or to mobilize your base. You know, the field day-to-day -day is, it's on the ground, right? And it's obviously different in this era of um, the coronavirus. And I've been talking to a lot of folks who are on campaigns now, because um, I'm not working directly on one. I'm advising a couple campaigns similar to Lisa, not helping them raise money. God bless fundraisers, because um, I, I spend the heck out of the money. Um, but, uh, you know, and it's different where you're, you know, usually, you know, you're, going through your call list and you're trying to meet up with volunteers one-on-one -on -one and, you know, you're trying to get them to do phone banks or do canvassing and knocking on doors, right? And then ultimately, as organizers, you're trying to build a leadership base so that way. Um, there's never enough people, so you need more volunteer leaders who have volunteers working with them in order to really expand it. We kind of call it the snowflake model. Um, but to really reach out to talk to as many people as possible means you got to recruit not just a bunch of volunteers, but some of those volunteers have to be leaders of their communities. So that way they can manage other volunteers in a way that the organizer cannot. The organizer, there's never enough organizers because you don't have enough money to have enough staff. Um, and so your day is about organizing. You know, I need to reach out. You know, you have goals. And like Lisa says, these goals change, right? Um, and so I'll give you a good example of a goal changing from a field perspective. I worked on the caucus in 2008 for Hillary um, and caucuses, for those who aren't familiar with one, I feel a certain way about them and it's not <laughs> something positive that I will say. Uh, but two, I know Kansas has a caucus, so that's speed. Um, but two, it is a organizing contest. Not many people participate. Um, and you know, you have to get your people to usually like a high school, you have to stand in certain corners of the room for your candidate. Um, if you don't have a certain number of people, you have to then try to get other people to come to your side. It's like this little bit of organizing chaos, organized chaos. Um, but anyway, and this is a similar, kind of a similar Obama story. This is when I worked for Hillary against Obama in the primary. Um, we had a goal that we were like, all right, we think, you know, Nevada was the first time it was one of the early four states um, in 2008, it usually, you know, I, you know, everyone hears about Iowa, New Hampshire, the first time Nevada was like before the rest of the contest, right? It was like Iowa, New Hampshire, Nevada, South Carolina. And so you just kind of, you didn't have any previous data to work on to make an assumption of how many people were gonna turn out. And so we were like, we think usually 
30,000 people caucus in Nevada, but it usually used to be in like May. So we think let's double that 60,000. And then you literally build all your goals off that. So you need all these precinct captains. They need to go find out all these people, et cetera. Well, about all my teams, like in November, the caucus was in January. By October, they all met their goals and they were doing great, blah, 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 blah. But then we got a tip that the Obama campaign was doing organizing meetings and telling people they were expecting 120,000 people to caucus, double. And we were like, ah, right? And so like, because literally it's about you getting specific people to your precinct for the caucus. If we didn't have, we, we, you know, some people will just show up, but caucuses again are so special. You gotta have that kind of relationship happening, right? So I'll never forget, we, we doubled our goals. And I'll never forget pulling our, my leadership together. I'm like, guys, I know you just got 100%, but now your goals are 50. And they were like, and sure enough, they worked for the next month. They got more supporters. They got all that stuff. They hit their goals and uh, 118,000 people or something like that caught this. So it was like right on. Uh, and so thank God. But like goals change and you just got to be prepared to go with the flow. And on the field side, it's all about organizing, reaching people, you know, doors, phones, and in this day and age, something we tried to do a lot in 2016 was to give organizers, people like to take digital and move it to like a different apartment. And I think there needs to be a digital apartment because you get your emails and blah, blah, blah. But if you're an organizer in 2020, you have to know how to use digital as a tool in your toolbox. You have to know how to get on Twitter and find people who are tweeting for your candidate in a certain geographic region and reach out to them and say, Hey, I see your supporter. Can I get you to be a volunteer? Right? Like the digital now needs to be in your toolbox. And that's not how it was when I started. Cause when Lisa and I started campaigns, there were no Facebook or Twitter. Um, and, and so the game is changing, but um, ultimately it goes back to persuasion, registration, mobilization, and building capacity to do those things. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you both for, for you know, outlining those priorities. That was awesome. So what is your craziest campaign story? can be good, bad, ugly, your favorite, your favorite story that you ever have. I'm, I have high expectations for these answers. So I'm excited. <laughs> I think I have to start this one, don't I? Dang it, should have flipped it. Um, uh, I will share, I'm gonna share two stories if you don't mind. Um, Absolutely. I'll be I'll, I'll be brief. Uh, one I'll just share the one I just shared with you guys beforehand. I was in um, it was 2016. I was in Philadelphia. Um, I was in New York for Hillary Clinton. Um, I had just left the White House a year before to go work for her. Uh, President Obama was doing a um, event, a rally for Hillary in Philly, and they wanted me to go down because I worked there to just brief him on. The campaign, how things were going, how things were looking, blah, blah, blah. And so I did that. I took the train down and briefed him, and it was awesome. You know, it's like, ah. um, and um, I, they were like, he was like, do you want to go to the fundraiser with me as well? I was like, okay. And so I like walked to the back of the staff caravan where the staff usually sit, right? There's all this, you know, all the protection and stuff. And I start to turn to go to the van, which is where you know, normally staff go. They were like, no, 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 he wants you to ride in the, in the beast. And I was like, the beast? <laughs> um, so that was a really cool experience, um, was riding, um, uh, you know, for 10 minutes next to him in, in, in the beast. Uh, I, I'll never uh, forget that. My other, it's not a campaign related story, but it's a political story, but I just, I it just, I'll never forget it. It's also related to President Obama, who I, is a very uh, and amazing individual, as is Hillary Clinton. Um, I was working in the White House and um, was going to leave, took two days off, th Thursday and Friday off, because I was gonna propose to my now wife in Puerto Rico. And I was gonna leave Thursday morning well, the day before I was scheduled to leave, um, I got an email that added me to like my first ever meeting with him on, I was working on ACA outreach, Affordable Care Act outreach, and I got added to a meeting in the morning. And I was like, I can't miss this meeting. It's my first meeting. Yeah, you know, I got ah. So I switched my flight and so I could leave later in the day and I go to the meeting and you know, you don't say, I sat in the back of the room, but it was, I was just like googly eyed in the meeting. And 
at the very end, you know, when the president stands up, you know, everybody stands up and he's like, hey, before I leave, I just want everyone to know that Marlon behind me, I didn't even think he like knew I was in the room. He's like, Marlon behind me is getting ready to fly to Puerto Rico to propose to his wife or his uh, fian- a girlfriend. And I was just like, <laughs> that's like, I just had the stone cold look. Cause he was like, how do you feel Marlon? I was like, I hope she says yes. <laughs> like, I said some stupid and ridiculous. My instinct after exciting things happen in life is to call my now wife. So I like called her immediately. And as I'm, the phone is ringing, I'm like, I can't tell her this story. It's about me proposing, which I have not done yet. <laughs> and so she answers the phone. I'm like, President Obama just told everybody that we're taking a vacation and it's important to get away to rest and recharge. And she was like, that's the weirdest thing ever. Um, fast forward a couple of days when I'm getting ready to propose, I was like, do you remember the story I told you about the president? She's like, yeah. She, I was like, well, what he really said was that I'm was flying down here to propose to you. And she's like, are you? And then that's when I proposed. So it was pretty, uh, I'll never forget that uh, moment um, and had to share that story because it's it is very been very impactful. And then we've been married almost six years now. Okay, I'm, I'm not even gonna share anything. I don't, <laughs> uh, no, there's, <laughs> I don't have an engagement. I don't have White House. <laughs> um, <laughs> Marlon, I'm jealous. Oh. <laughs> I, I know in that fundraiser, I know you got some stories. <laughs> well, um, I will say as being in the Republican party, one of the things you miss out on um, is celebrities. We don't have any. I mean, we do. We, we have like three or four and they're like 80. Um, and so when we do get celebrities, it's the biggest deal. Um, and this was way back when, this is crazy, but I was the finance director for Charlie Crist, who used to be a Republican. <laughs> so he was the governor of Florida and he was running for Senate. And um, it was really um, cool traveling with him because he had a lot of celebrity friends. I'm not sure how, but he just did. Um, but at that time, when he was a Republican, remember, he's now a Democrat member of Congress. And he lost the seat that Marco Rubio ended up winning. And then Marco Rubio ended up running for president. So it just goes to show how crazy, crazy politics is. And unless you're dead, don't count anyone out because people come back and come back and come back. Anyways, um, at the same time, Arnold Schwarzenegger was a governor in California. And that's a celebrity to me. And I remember we did an event at his house and um, I remember thinking, oh my God, I should take something from the house. Uh, I didn't, I didn't, but I took a picture like in the bathroom and I thought it was the most like, crazy thing that I took a picture in the bathroom. But um, that was like my closest celebrity encounter I've had. And it's just a crazy story because of all the dynamics behind it. And like, who would have ever thought that Arnold Schwarzenegger would be a Republican, let alone a Republican governor? Um, but that was that was one of my close cool celebrity stories. I will tell you the most exciting event I ever worked on, and I never in a million years would have imagined happened, is um, when Romney was running for president, he decided, whether people agree with it or not, to do an international trip. Um, which I'm sure Marlon was very happy about because we ended up going to London where Romney made that comment about the Olympics and how they were running it, which didn't bode well, but whatever. Um, And then my part of it was we ended up going to Israel. And so I did a fundraiser in Israel for Mitt Romney for president. Um, At the time, Mitt Romney was extremely popular in Israel. Obama was that just wasn't his, that wasn't his thing at the time. And so when we went there, we were treated like the president of the United States. It was one of the most amazing experiences. Um, it was, it was difficult. Um, there were a lot of legal things we had to deal with because, you know, you're raising money from Americans, but you're in Israel. Um, but it just goes to show you never know where fundraising takes you whether it's, you know, a billionaire's home in Palm Beach or Israel. 
um, where you're, you know, at a hotel overlooking the old city. Um, but those are kind of my stories. I will say after hearing Marlon, I would really, really like to have a White House story. Um, I just have to figure out how to get on a campaign that wins. <laughs> <laughs> a good a, a good idea that that sounds that's how you get your your white house story so there you go um i do want to ask and i hate to have to make you play favorites but what has been your favorite campaign you've ever worked on oh uh, should i do i go first now i forgot okay <laughs> hands down governor romney um and the reason why, I mean, working on a presidential is amazing. Um, it's one of the most exciting things in the world. Um, you know, speaking of pizza and politics, your life is pizza. So you don't look the greatest, but you have the most amazing time. Uh, I also, you know, after the campaign, you know, during the camp, people were like, well, Mitt's so stiff, Mitt's so weird. What's it like? And I'm like, no, 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 he isn't. He's the coolest guy. He's actually really cool. And then Netflix came out after the campaign with the Mitt documentary, which I highly recommend, which shows the real Mitt Romney, um, which literally when he was, you know, ironing his shirt, uh, <laughs> like that's Mitt Romney. Um, so it was very fun. I became very close with him and his wife. Um, and there, there's, there's, there's nothing that beats being on finance in a presidential campaign, period. You could be on the hottest Senate race. You could be working at the Republican National Committee, the National Republican Senatorial Committee, but there, it's really hard after that to get super excited about something. Um, and it's also important, you know, I, you know, Marlon and I probably have a lot of clients, but there's few that were probably very close. I, I shouldn't speak for Marlon, but for me that I'm actually really close with and so you kind of put your heart and your soul into it. I love all my guys, but I have a special place in my heart for Mitt Romney. So that, that was the most exciting campaign. And I do not know what he plans to do in the future. People always ask me. Um, I have no idea, but I will be there for him, whatever he decides. That's awesome. Um, and on the flip side, mine was Obama 2012. Um, and I want to preface that by saying I... 2016 was really hard and it was really hard to put despite the outcome it was just it was a new year and like how social media was used the disinformation um you know the how media reports on campaigns now like it was just hard that being said um Hillary's manager is, is a close friend and um I would go to the bathroom any day of the week she herself is uh, an amazing individual who like um, is one of the like smartest people I've ever met. And you know, when the um, shootings of black people happened in South Carolina uh, during that campaign, one of her first calls was to me just to ask how I was doing. And that's just kind of how the person she is that I just think it's important to note because very easy when I don't say 2016, people are like, oh, did you hate it? Um, uh, given the outcome, but that's not that's not the case at all. But 2012 was just, I think, a special time. I think it was, um, again, before the landscape is what it is today. Like, campaign landscape right now is just, it's a different beast um, for a variety of reasons, uh, much of which we probably don't need to discuss on this call. Um, you know, to be, I, I worked for President Obama in 08. You know, I worked for Hillary in the primary. And then when um, we were, uh, when we lost, I went and worked in Missouri. And so I had a weird year in 08 because, you know, we won a bunch of the states we were in for Hillary, but she ultimately lost. And then I went to Missouri to help lead the efforts in my home state for Obama and the general. And while, you know, he has his electoral landslide, but then we lose Missouri by 0.3%. Uh, and so I was like, I can't do anything right this year. Um, and while I felt a part of the team, you know, I was, you know, obviously team Hillary first before I went moved to Obama, but like starting 2012 at the very beginning. So I was actually on the campaign in 2011, working all the way through, um, you know, personally being a part of the 
re-election for the first black president of the United States. Um, there was just so many special things of that for me. Um, managing the field program and like seeing like folks who were like organizers in previous campaigns where I worked with now like running their states. So there's nothing also better. I'm sure these feel the same way. When we see folks who have worked for you um, like now run things like Joe Biden's current national GOTB director was an intern for me in 2012, right? And so like you start seeing that, like you just feel like um, that that brings you a lot of joy when you just see folks who are just super talented and you had to you know you play a small role in, in helping them and now they're like doing big things. And so I felt that way also 2012 with like the team and stuff like that. So just, and then, you know, winning is great. <laughs> um, so uh, a lot of good things about, about that campaign that makes it my favorite. Awesome, great. Well, I have one more question before we move in into some audience Q and A. So, last question for me: um, How different are U.S. House races to U.S. Senate races to presidential campaigns? Do you have a preference on which to work on? Um, I think so. They're all very different, and. They're very different, but very, but very the same. And so what I mean by that is, if you go back to those four pillars I talked about, registration, mobilization, persuasion, building capacity, that's really every campaign. You could be running, where you're running for mayor of Lawrence or you are running for president of the United States, you're trying to do something around those things, right? So there's similarities in all campaign. As Lisa can speak better than I am, I can, the amount of money you raise on a presidential campaign is very different uh, than anything else. Um, I like, I think presidential is the best because um, you feel like you have the resources. You, you, there's never enough, but you do feel like you have significant amount of resources to kind of just do, play around with, make mistakes, do different things in ways that uh, and obviously there's just like a lot of just attention nationally. So your ability from a perspective of trying to get volunteers is easier. Um, that being said, there's also a little fun in the challenge of like you're on the house race and you're, you know, a lot of people in the house are well known, but not obviously as well known as, as that was running for president. And um, how do you try to like, you know, get volunteers and, and get people in the door? Like that challenge is also somewhat fun. Um, but I think I like the presidential race the best. And I would just say, even house races and Senate races are different. And so if you're running for Senate in Missouri, um, my home state, you know, it's not as expensive to do TV in St. Louis and Kansas City if you versus running for Senate in New York, where you're paying for TV in the New York media market, right? So um, even across states, um, forget Senate being different in House, but even across state, a Senate race is very different. And at least it's experience, I'm sure, in Michigan right now, you know, um, a Senate race is different in, in each state. And so how you, the approach may be a little different, um, but, you know, the amount of resources you raise is going to be drastically different depending on whatever state that you're in. Um, so for me, there's a huge difference between House, Senate, and presidential. Um, Usually as a fundraiser, I always tell, you know, people are going to, who are about to go into fundraising, pick which one you want to do. And this is when it comes to high dollar donors and when it comes to PACs, political action committees, because different donors kind of concentrate on different things. Yes, you have your certain donors who will give across the board. Um, you know, they'll, they'll focus on House, Senate, presidential, but then there are a lot of donors who just like to focus, let's say on a local house race or are more into the majority in the Senate or love to be in presidential. Um, so for me, in my career, I have focused mainly on the Senate. Um, once in a big while, I will take on a house candidate. And so a couple of years ago, um, I was approached by an unknown congressman, Congressman Mike Pence, um, to be his finance director. And I was like, okay. And so I met him. And by the way, I always, I, I always recommend meeting the candidate. Don't go through the chief of staff because that, that leads to a bad relationship right off 
from the get-go. Um, and I met with Mike Pence and I thought, God, I really like this guy. And I was thinking, I think he'd be, he could be governor one day. Um, and at that time when he was in Congress, the rumor was he was thinking of either running for governor or for president. Um, so I took on Mike Pence, but one of the reasons I did, I did Mike Pence um, was because he wanted to meet people nationally. Um, if I would have done his local stuff, meaning in Indiana or pack stuff in DC, I probably wouldn't have done that well because I don't have those connections. I do have the national connections. Um, and by the way, you guys, setting up meetings with Mike Pence when he was a member of Congress, people were like, who, what, who's that? And I was like, just come for free. Uh, people would meet him and then they would love him. And obviously now he's, he's doing pretty well. Um, but it, it's, it's a very different um, experience. I will say as much as I enjoyed working for Governor Romney for president, um, I tend to like working on Senate races better because the team is smaller. Um, you have more interaction with each other. Um, and I really like dealing with the candidate directly. And so I feel on a Senate race, I have more access to them. Um, for me to be successful as a fundraiser, I need the candidate to pick up the phone. I need the candidate to answer texts. Um, and so I need to be in touch with them and that tends to be a little harder, you know, once you get into presidential and there's just a huge team uh, uh, working on things. So that's, that's my thing. But by the way, if I will say the, the only caveat to anything I said, what, even for, because I've worked for some governors and this and that, is if I really like someone, no matter what they're running for, I'll probably go, go work for them because to me, raising money, it's a very, uh, I have to be personally into it to do a good job. So if someone comes to me and says, you know, I'm running for this house seat, it's in the middle of New Mexico, and I don't know anything about New Mexico, but I'm really in love with them, and I really believe in them and think that they might have a future, I'll probably sign on to that race. Awesome. Great. Well, we do have um, a question from a guest. So the question is, do either of you have phone banking advice? It seems like a lot of people aren't answering because of robocalls or spam detection. Should we give up on phone banking? <laughs> Marlon, do you want to go for, you want me to go first or what? <laughs> <laughs> um, you sh so I wouldn't give up. I would just be, um, I would go into it knowing a couple things. One, every cycle, response rates of number of people who answer the phones goes drastically down. Um, one, people don't have as many home phones anymore. And two, and it's harder to, for campaigns to get cell phones. Uh, and two, people in, around this time, like if you have a cell phone and you see a number you don't know, are you picking up, right? Um, so that being said, every time I get like frustrated at phone banking, Literally the next time, the next call I make is like a caller and I have this amazing conversation and then like you feel like you've changed someone. And so I do think, and then, so if you think about if you're doing that and there's another 100,000 of you across the country doing the same thing, that's a lot of people who are having very good conversations about the campaign. So um, is it frustrating sometimes? Yes. Um, is it effective? Yes. And so I would say, keep at it, just understand that you may every you may speak to five people out of every hundred you call and just know that's okay. And just know that there's many more out there like you doing the same thing and those numbers add up over time. I, I will say that I mentioned earlier that even at this point in my career, I still volunteer. And one of the things I love doing, and it's usually happens about now because it's at some point, like I said before, the money, it's, it's the money. Um, we are, we got it in, we're, we're, we're looking at other things. And so what I usually like doing is doing phone banking. Um, and in DC, what I'll do is I'll organize um, donors, friends, and we'll go to, you know, a law firm. Obviously, I don't know what we're going to do this year, but you could still do things online. Um, and we'll do phone banking. And I've learned a couple things on, on phone banking. One, do not take it personally. And I know that's hard, but sometimes people will tell you to go 
F off <laughs> and you've got to be like, okay, this isn't personal. They have no idea who I am. I've never talked to them before in my life. But I 1 million percent agree with Marlon that all the hangups you get and all the, you know, answering machines you get, when you reach that one person and you have a good conversation with them, it goes a long way because that person is probably going to hang up and then tell their friends, oh, I just got a call from the John James campaign. This girl was amazing. We had the best call. This is why, you know, I don't know if you knew this about John James. And then they're going to tell another friend and another friend. Um, so, it, it, you know, and, th and this is, you know, Marlon's expertise is grassroots and reaching out, but just getting that one person to answer. The other thing I think is very important about phone banking is, you know, I'm getting texts all the time, you know, from Donald Trump Jr. <laughs> By the way, I know it's not him. I'm always like, oh, Don Jr. Um, but when you get a personal, when you get someone who's leaving you a message and it's a real person, it's not a recording like, hey, you know, this is Tracy, I'm volunteering. That kind of means something. And it makes me think of the campaign differently. And then, by the way, even though I'm in politics, I need to be reminded to vote sometimes. I need to be reminded to get my absentee or whatever it is. So it helps. It definitely helps. I, I just want to double down that last point. Everything's so digital nowadays, where you get a text or you know, digital ad or whatever, that to actually hear from a human, you know, and I, you know, especially when canvassing is not happening as much because of everything going on, but actually hear from a human, it just it's different. You're not used to it as much anymore, right? Um, I'm sure the majority of folks watching this now text versus talk on the phone, because that's just, it's easier um, to just say, oh, I'll just shoot blah, blah, blah. Hey mom, you know? So I just want to double down that point. It, it, that's another reason it makes it different because you're just, like, when you hear a human, you're like, what? Like, while we've been on the phone, someone called left me a voicemail. I was like, who is that? <laughs> a voicemail, what is that? Yeah, so I agree. Awesome. I did a lot of phone banking this summer. So those were, those were great reminders. So I, I appreciated that. Um, we have another audience question. How did you get the credibility to work on these big campaigns? <laughs> it's how much money you raise. For, for me, for, for fundraising, it's about my numbers. And the thing about numbers versus, let's say, certain other jobs is mine's, mine's in black and white. You can just go to fec.gov and look at what we've raised. So that's the thing about fundraising is you know, you, you know, you start out, you're, you're doing it and, you know, you want to come out and say, all right, I raised this much for, so my first big client was Senator John Thune, who I love and I still love. Um, I was his finance director for seven years. He had just beaten Tom Daschle. Nobody really knew who he was, um, which is amazing to watch his career because now he's at the top of the Senate um, and he's just a really, really nice guy. But it was raising money for him and breaking records. And, you know, again, it's FEC reports. It's, you know, to me, one of the things, the way I kind of sold myself to people as a good fundraiser was not only did I raise a lot, but I spent very little. So one of the things you should look for when you're looking at presidential fundraising right now, because I know that's the most exciting thing. And this is kind of what all the articles are about is, not only is Biden out raising Trump, but, but Biden has more cash on hand. And so as a fundraiser, it was important for me not only to raise a lot, but to also have a lot of cash on hand. So not spend money on events, not waste, you know, on con extra consultants or things like that. So those were, but, but I do think that's important by the way, the cash on hand thing and people kind of don't uh, kind of forget that when you hear fundraising numbers, oh, this person raised a hundred million, right. But what did they spend it on? Um, and how much do they have left to put it in advertising? But for me, it was just all about numbers and trying to raise more. Yeah, and I, I, um, I think there's two things that help you get credibility. One is you just work your tail off. And for, um, for, for me, um, I think my skill set is also um, uh, inspiring other people. And that just helps me be what I would like to say as a, as a good manager. And so um, 
the end of the day, to be able to move up, you got to manage, right? Um, not just a strategy, but you got to manage people. Um, and so that's something that um, I enjoyed doing. And I think people could see that. And so I became a useful asset in terms of like, how could I see the overall strategy, but also help manage people. At the same time, I know Lisa would agree with this, like name of games networking. Right. And so when I was starting off as a young organizer, I, those who were above me, I just tried to soak in as much knowledge as possible and not like, you know, kissing their behinds because like, oh, I want to be like you, you know, but I was just like, how'd you get to it? Like similar conversations were happening today. How'd you get to where you got to? What steps did you take? Right. Because I was legitimately curious and I was like, is this a career? Can you make a career out of this? First and foremost question. And if so, how the heck do you do it? And as I engaged people who had done it before in those questions, they saw I was like a hungry and young organizer who just was ready to go out and do whatever um, to um, help change our country. And so that sticks with people. So when they are hiring for the next job, then they are like, oh, you remember Marlon who I met? When he was driving me around um, when I worked for the DNC, right? right? So it is, it's both just doing a good job and then it's about who you meet because this game, I mean, this town's small, DC small, the game is small. Um, and so being the right people uh, and having the right attitude is, is equally as important. Awesome. So a few more questions. We have another one from um, another audience member. How did you get your first big break? Was your degree a huge um, you know, asset in, in your job search? Uh, my degree was very huge. And I think I mentioned at the very beginning, I started as an engineering major at KU in computer science. I was doing great. You know, sitting behind a computer. Um, and then switched to communication studies, which again, Esther Marshall was like, what are you doing? Um, and when I didn't, I don't think I like fully realized why I was moving in that way at the time, because I was probably like too young to like really fully conceptualize it. But what I realized is that I really want to know how people will communicate with one another, what makes effective communication. And I did a lot of um, studying at the time of organizational communication, like how do organizations work, how do people talk to one another in communications, and I've used that all throughout politics all throughout what I've done, right? When you become a leader and a manager, then you are, you know, you've seen organizations crumble because their infrastructure um, and the way they, they, their communication systems internally are just um, faulty. And so organizations crumble and you don't set a good culture and a good tone. Uh, and so I learned a lot at KU without thinking, without knowing that's what I was doing. And I, like, comes back and I was like, oh, like I think a lot of the reason I approach situations in this way is because when I was studying and getting that communication studies degree, like actually I'm figuring out how do these organizations work, right? How do you avoid groupthink while also providing uh, a way for everyone to feel heard? Um, so it definitely helped me out. And then, um, uh, yeah, it definitely made a difference for me without me even knowing it. Um, I think my, the biggest thing I will say for those who are in school is um, just find something you love and 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 be and don't and be know that like that may change, right? Like and it's okay. I didn't go into communication studies because I said that like I'm gonna go work at high levels on campaigns and work in the White House. Like I didn't I didn't know what that was gonna be. I was just like you know I'm curious how people communicate, so I'm gonna go do that right now and then we'll see what's out there. And um, I try not to get when I was in engineering, I was like, I'm gonna go do this, I'm gonna go work at Intel and I'm gonna do that. And then I just realized for me, for me in college, um, let me focus on the here and now, let me just enjoy what I'm doing. Um, you know, I wanna have a path, but also be flexible enough to not be too rigid in that path. Cause I feel like sometimes if you get too rigid, there's an opportunity right in front of you and you miss it. Um, so that'd be my advice I give as well. Like find something you love, have a goal, but also don't be too rigid to the goal that you're gonna miss other opportunities that may be dangling in your face. Um, regrettably, I was a horrible student. It's true. 
Um, I barely, barely made it through school. I was, um, I just wasn't focused. Um, I, I think I had a boyfriend back home. I was constantly flying back. And um, so, so for me, a lot of my career has been a lot of learning um, and I read a ton. I read everything. Um, and I feel like if I could tell the younger me something, it would have been to focus more. I think she froze on us. Yeah. Uh oh. Risa! <laughs> Am I? There you go. You're back. <laughs> All right. I, I, I got unstable. Um, I don't know where it stopped. Um, I was we got all the, everything about reading we got. Yes. Yes. And if, if I could tell my younger self anything, it would be to get a law degree. Um, if I wanted to go into politics, um, and the reason is, is I think you get good communication skills going to law school. I think you learn a lot about the history of this country, which I really had to learn much later on. And I know that sounds kind of silly, but it's true. Um, and I, I kind of wish I had that education to, you know, a law degree to maybe fall back on. Um, but that's what, if, if, if I was advising someone who was still in school where to, you know, and if they were sure they wanted to be in politics, I would probably um, say that. Now that being said, a lot of fundraising is kind of street smarts um, and it's kind of knowing people and how to talk to them and being able to network and things like that. So I'm not sure for my field if it would have mattered if I would have graduated, you know, with straight A's, um, you know, because fundraising is a very people person job and just kind of being able to read people well. So I realize that's not the greatest answer to tell kids in a university. <laughs> um, but again, if I could, I, I would have gone into law, 100%. One, one thing to add, I, I know Lisa's gonna agree with this because I actually started. I love, again, I love my degree and degree helpful. What I really loved at KU was the extracurricular activities I did. So for me, it was student senate. I bet you for Lisa, it was the college Republicans. And A, you worked with other students to solve issues, whatever it was, you know, either to fundraise for college Republicans, to do, you know, policy for student center or whatever. Um, and it's just like that, that to me is like starting to set an example of like what the real world's gonna look like, what it's like to work with others the group experience, you're working for things you're passionate about. So I would say in addition to like, you know, obviously figuring out what that degree is for folks, but I, what, what are you passionate about? Um, and, I, if, and I can only imagine if in my day there was an organization for, for everything, I know in 2020, there's an organization for everything. And if not, start that joint. Like, so um, getting involved to that, I, I learned so much from just like, being in it than just like doing the classwork is uh it, it, to me it was both and for me awesome well i have one more question for both of you you've touched on this a little bit but what is your best advice to students who are currently working on campaigns now in this election cycle or those who have previously but want to again what's what's your best advice you have uh my my advice, and I cannot say this enough, but it's it's not just volunteering. It's following up on where you volunteered and what you did with it. So let's say I have a volunteer. So I'm doing an event next week, actually. So I have a fundraiser I'm doing next week, and I have a volunteer, someone who's going to help volunteer. I'm so busy. I'm going to forget that. I'm going to forget what we did. It's on him to continue to follow up with me to continue to ask if he can volunteer for things and be in touch. So it's not just going to an event volunteering and be like, yeah, see ya. It's the follow-up you do with it. It's continuing to do it. One of the reasons I think that 
I did well, let's say within the Republican party in DC is I was constantly at events. So I would be the person who was kind of always there. And I was also the person who always said yes. There was never, oh, I have a date tonight, or you know, I'm watching Law and Order. I'm trying to remember what was on TV at that time. Um, but it was always <laughs> saying yes, always being there, always following up. Because remember, people are busy. They got stuff going on. Elections make people crazy. It's up to you to, you know, keep be in their orbit, orbit, and keep it up. Um, but it's the people, you know, I had a guy two years ago intern for me and he was the yes guy. And I told him, I said, always say yes to people. He now has an amazing, amazing job at the White House. And I'm not surprised because it's those people that kind of climb the ladder. Remember, it's DC, just like Hollywood. It's extremely competitive here. Um, you know, the experiences Marlon had, th that is so rare, you guys. And you to get to get to where he, I mean, or, or the experiences I have, to get to where we are, you've got to do something that sets you apart from everywhere from everyone else. And when you're in school and you can volunteer, the thing that sets you apart is the that you're saying yes all the time. You're following up and saying thank you. What can I do again? And you're just being there in the moment. Just remember, you're competing against thousands. I, I compare it to Hollywood because you know we're the Hollywood of politics. It's very competitive out there. Um, so what sets you apart? And and say yes. <laughs> Plus one to all that. <laughs> the only thing I will add on top of that is politics can do either two things for you as just an individual being. One is it can help you find your authentic self or it can turn you um, and help and bring out the ego in you that you are not actually connected to your authentic self is that you are um, becoming someone that you're probably really not. And I would just always encourage you to anchor into who you really are because it's very easy in this game. You see like, well, it's power play and people move like this and they got to do that or whatever. The good ones who rise to the top are the ones who are anchored into who they are and are doing it for the right reasons and never forget that and never let what can be seen on the media as power and money and all that stuff be your, just be your North Star. Like if you're, if you're, on a campaign now, or you're interested in being on a campaign, there's a reason you want to do that and never lose sight of what that reason is. Um, because the minute you do is the minute that um, it'll set you back. Awesome. Wow, well, what a great program this was. I appreciate both of you and, and all of your, your awesome insight. And thank you all for, for tuning in today on our YouTube live channel. Um, one more announcement, our Winner of the free pizza drawing is Mr. Hunter Fairherm. Um, so please, Hunter, you can email me. We'll make sure to, to give you my email address so we can get that, that free pizza coupon over to you. Um, and join us on Friday, November 13th for a conversation about the recent developments in Hong Kong with KU law professor Virginia Harper Ho. Um, we'll have a lot of more information um, about that event coming out soon. But thank you both to our guests and thank you all for tuning in today. Rock chalk all day long. <laughs> thank you both so much. It was a great program. I appreciate it. Appreciate you. Take care, everybody. Bye. Oh. We good?